Okay, great. That All was right, wonderful. Done. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you everyone for coming to our lecture tonight to the three codes of Adonijah Bidwell. I'm Heather Kowalski, the executive director of the Bidwell House Museum. And before we begin, I just want to note a couple of things. First, uh, please keep yourself muted uh, just to, so we don't get any background noise. But if you want to leave your camera on, you're certainly welcome to. The controls for both of those things are at the lower left of your screen. So David will be showing a few slides tonight, which I'll share at various points during the presentation. And if you have any questions, please type them into the chat feature at any point during the talk, and we'll take some time at the end to answer as many as we can. So for those of you not familiar with David, uh, David Powers is a native of Springfield, Massachusetts. He was educated at Carleton College in Northfield, Minnesota, where he majored in Latin. His graduate studies were at Harvard University and the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome, Italy. In 2013, David tackled the short writing of Reverend Adonijah Bidwell, and he was able to decipher some pages at that time. His current research expands on his prior discoveries, and David is the author of two volumes, a biography of the Puritan founder of Springfield, Massachusetts, Damnable Heresy, William Pynchon, The Indians, and the First Book Band, and Burned in Boston, and Good Comfortable Words, The Coded Sermon Notes of John Pynchon and the Frontier Preaching Ministry of George Moxon. And now I'm happy to introduce David Powers. Well, thank you very much. I uh, very much appreciate this opportunity to share some uh, information about a person of some importance to the, the house, which is um, virtually behind me. Uh, and uh, to talk a little bit about short writing and how it functioned in the, uh, in the time in the 7th, 16th, 17th and 18th centuries. If you are connected with the Bidwell House Museum, you may know the background story uh, better than I. Housatonic Township number one sat on high ground between Bear Town and Hunger Mountains in the Berkshire Hills in Western Massachusetts. Some initial settlers may have come in 1735, but records report that the land was purchased, in quotes, from indigenous people only in 1737, when Ephraim Williams, a major developer in Western Massachusetts, and other entrepreneurs bought a large tract of high country from John Pofnehonawa and his colleagues for 300 pounds. The Reverend Adonijah Bidwell, 1716, his birth, 1784, his death, came there in 1750 to serve as minister and farmer for the rest of his life. Much of the village disappeared long ago, but Bidwell's legacy continues in the museum located in his house built in the 1760s, which as you know, holds numerous manuscripts in his handwriting. What was his ministry like? An internet site proclaims without any citation that Bidwell, quote, often centered his sermons around freedom, penning them in a cryptographic code to disguise the language to potential readers, unquote. Another site adds, quote, Reverend Bidwell's sermons often dealt with love or forgiveness. However, his shorthand code is too complex to gain more than a basic feel of a sermon, unquote. Well, there's a danger in basing historical anal analysis on wishful thinking like this. No matter how dramatic it may be, these claims are simply not backed up by the facts. There are two distinctive systems of short writing, shorthand, in the papers left by Adonijah Bidwell. It is possible to read both. The first 
and we could have the first uh, slide at this point. The first is a code-based system where symbols stand for complete words. Only frequent words are so treated. For example, a Greek letter theta represents God, a capital P written in as a squared box represents spirit, a cursive capital D stood for death, and a small b stands for body. Bidwell also used abbreviations of sorts, such as the final letters of common short monosyllabic words, re meaning there, ey for they, and ir for there, t-h-e-i-r. Some of his abbreviation symbols were inspired by Latin. E-I-E -E meant to him, sine meant without, and a block letter D meant dominus for Lord. And some were from Greek. A nu stood for nomos or law. The resulting combination of some symbols amid many comp complete words make this first code easier to read. Here is a closer look on the next slide. And I'll read uh, some of it for us. Um, Angels fell, Revelation 12, four. Do you see that point up in the upper left-hand corner? Some suppose that about the same number of the race human were elected as fallen angels and those to fill the seats of, and vacancy that was made in heaven. But certain tis, there were many of them legion, Mark 5, 9 to 13, if not multitudes of them, how could they always be present with every individual person in earth? What person upon the face of earth is not attended and followed by a tempting devil? wherever he goes. And I, I'll let the rest of it go. Uh, there is an ubi in there, you may notice where, uh, Latin um, and eodem temporary at the same time, the last two words. Okay, Bidwell became more reliant on short writing in his later years. His second code depended heavily on cipher, stringing together the sounds of a word in sequence, enabling the shorthand user to write anything. It is much more adaptable than a single system symbol for every word, but it's much more difficult to unravel. Instead of theta for God, for example, he now used a lambda, Shelton's symbol for G. If the slanted, scratchier, darker, and briefer sections in his manuscripts betray a mere, more mature hand, which is my assumption, we may identify the heavier notes and later thoughts inserted into his, as later thoughts inserted into his manuscripts. Here is what the second code looked like. You can see a pretty good uh, comparison of the first code on the top of the page, and then the scrawls in his second code on the bottom. And here, next slide, is a detail from that code. And I'll read it. It begins part way down, halfway down, because of the slant on the, on the left side. Objection to the Christian's duty discovered, i.e., not to yield, but resist and opposed. We must either resist or be taken captive. We never get rid of that hymn but by resisting. If we parley and treat, we must expect to be triumphed over and trampled. Okay. Uh, short writing or shorthand was commended to ministers long before Bidwell's time. Henry Dix wrote in 1633, quote, be very perfect in the practice of this art before you begin to write sermons, unquote. The appeal was not because such systems were speedy. The minister had time enough for study. Rather, short writing saved paper. And that 
was a necessary, valuable commodity for the minister, especially on the frontier. Bidwell had a bewildering array of short writing alphabets to choose from. In the 1870s, William P. Upham cataloged 26 distinct shorthand alphabets developed between 1602 and 1753. It turns out that Bidwell's cryptographic code was a relatively straightforward version of Thomas Shelton's second system, his 1659 Zeliographia, and we can have that slide. Somebody, as you can see, has tried their own practice down, down on the right side there. Like other shorthand systems of the day, Shelton relied on characters for consonants around which the vowels were indicated at specific points. The letter A was indicated by a point at the top of the initial letter, 12 o'clock, and then in descending order on the right side of the letter, E, I at three o'clock, O and U at six o'clock, the bottom. The subsequent consonant would be placed at that point, uh, thus creating a syllable. A few of Bidwell's manuscripts did have complete words formed by this system. Although Bidwell used Shelton's alphabet and Shelton's characters for biblical books, except the names of the Gospels, he generally wrote only the opening letters of a word, followed by a dash. The same symbol could first stand for multiple words, the next slide. And here you see how the symbol, the uh, opening symbols could be used for any word beginning with that sound. The PR symbol, for example, could mean proverbs, prince, principles, providence, or proof. As many as 20 other Shelton characters served as first letter indicators. <laughs> A six stood for words beginning with WH, such as who, which, when, what, why, etc., depending on the context. And uh, a uh, closed parenthesis stood for M, representing man, men, make, may, more, means, etc. A B represented words beginning with TH such as thing, think, these, those, this, and so forth. Only the context would clarify the symbol's meaning, but usually the result is not too difficult uh, to decipher. I, I do have a puzzle for you, which is quite difficult to decipher, and I may share that later on. The alterations, um, and we don't need any more pictures now, uh, we don't. We can get off the screen share. The alterations Bidwell made to Shelton's system offer a prime example of one important fact about short writing. Everybody adapted. Rarely did anyone follow a system without enhancing it, honing it amending it, simplifying it, reshaping it to fill their, fit their own circumstances. In that regard, each practitioner is unique and each manuscript presents its own challenges. So at the conference I attended uh, about this uh, in the uh, University of Hamburg, um, everybody gave their presentation and all you could say is, hmm, that's interesting. There was uh, nothing that was in common. On the theme of freedom, contrary to internet sources, it appears that Bidwell's uh, his manuscripts contain very little on that topic. Surveying a major sampling of Bidwell's manuscripts reveals that instead of being a central theme, freedom as a word does not even occur in his sermon notes. And the word free occurs only three times. The one time the word liberty occurs, it seems to mean license 
or irresponsibility. Furthermore, Bidwell's language had little mention of love or forgiveness. Instead, uh, it is rife with references to conflict. He is especially keen on battling the unseen forces of evil, which cruelly beset God's people. Bidwell's sermon texts were generally derived from the New Testament and the Psalms. He presented his hearers with lively images to help them see the unseen. He urged them to glimpse the snares and pitfalls all around them. His congregation was comprised of struggling farmers on a site so unpromising and possibly harassed by demons that the population eventually moved to a valley some miles to the south. Among manuscripts on the Congregational Library and Archives Boston website, New England Hidden Histories, is material by Bidwell labeled Sermon One. It consists of 33 pages in short writing, includes notes for several sermons in both his earlier and his later systems. At least four pages deal with keeping the Sabbath. Fourteen others are devoted to the cosmic conflict between angels and devils, good and evil, heaven and hell. This latter material includes several pages which are written as a fairly thorough discourse on the subject, composed in complete sentences using his first code. But there are portions in broken grammar grammar, which were rough notes probably written later in his career using the second cipher. Bidwell's messages were laden with frightening images. There are evil spirits, devils, or fallen angels, Bidwell warned his congregation in a carefully com com uh, composed manuscript in his earlier hand. However, much of Bidwell's writings presents a problem. He seems to have borrowed liberally from others. His notes reproduced whole swaths of commentary from several notable scholars. He copied from Henry Schugel's 1677, The Life of God and the Soul of Man. Matthew Poole's 1683, Annotations Upon the Holy Bible. Matthew Henry's 1708 to 1710, Exposition of the Old and New Testaments. William Burkett's 1709, Expository Notes. And Isaac Watts' 1737, The Doctrine of the Passions Explained and Improved. And Watts, again, then relatively recent 1753 sermons, discourses, and essays, volume two. All of them were from an older generation, and all the authors were long gone. Only Watts was close to contemporary. He died two years before Bidwell came to Monterey. Bidwell doesn't seem to have read any more current authors. That suggests he was one of the traditionalist old light school, not of the evangelical new light school that sparked the great awakening. At least one of his comments backed that up. At one point, he, chose, he echoes Henry Skugel in the limits of religious experience in the sermons on, on Galatians 4.19. Next. Three, moving affections, rapturous beats, ecstatic devotion, praying with passion, thinking of heaven with pleasures, with pleasure, being affected with kind and melting expressions with which they court their savior, these are resemblances of piety and of obtaining it 
but not the whole of religion. Okay, uh, now we can go off the, uh, the screen share. None of the sources he used would have been familiar to any of his auditors. Still, he never labeled the material he plagiarized, not even parenthetically, and he never included citations. Carrying handwritten notes into the pulpit meant he did not carry the original books to read aloud. But no matter, no matter how honorable his motives may have been, his material came from others. At this point, an uncomfortable reality emerges. Bidwell's reputation becomes problematic thanks to the ability to read short writing of two and a half centuries ago. Who knows what other myths may collapse, what other assumptions may fall, what other reputations may come into question as a result of reading short writing from bygone era, eras. In Bidwell's case, there may be a silver lining to this cloud over his reputation. He may have, and this is more speculative, he may have been speaking also in a third code. Bidwell's sermons always deal with scriptural themes. He would not have preached revolution, so to speak. No direct endorsement of anything secular, like revolutionary slogans, government, events, soldiers, crowds. But he could speak in figurative and symbolic language, and I think he did. An example in material he copied is from his sermon dated 1754 and 1774. He gave the years only. The text was a Bidwell favorite, 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Whatever his meaning in 1754, it's possible the meaning in 1775 had to do with the dangerous, conflicted atmosphere of that time. Like many clergy of his era, Bidwell was a supporter of the revolutionary cause. Immediately after the date, he cited a section from William Burkett's expository notes, which includes stirring language about your adversary. Um, and on, I think we're down further. Further on down is slide eight. Yeah, that's, that's it, I guess, slide eight, yes. Uh, note how every word contains a speculative motive to Christian watchfulness. We can uh, go on, I think, to the next is a, a, a more detailed view of that. Yeah, a special notice to Christian watchfulness. Your adversary, who will do you all mischief, he is the enemy, an accuser, one who seeks all advantages against you. He is cru a cruel adversary, a, roar, a lion, yea, roaring lion, who adds terror to cruelty, restless adversary, who seeks he may devour, for that's the bait he gapes for. The way to overcome him? is by resisting, not by yielding, said Bidwell. He is cowardly and conquered enemy. Resist him and he will run, unquote. 
He further remarks on James 4, 7 in notes that were probably for another sermon borrowed from Matthew Poole's annotations. You can't be uh, slide uh, um, 10. You can't be conquered so long as you do not consent. Um, uh, I don't know how the slides are adding up here. In what is most likely still another sermon, yeah, he, he echoed Burkett again, saying the devil is both a conquering and cowardly common uh, enemy, um, though bold faced yet faint heart, resist him and he will flee. There is a certain repetition of these phrases. So the issue may not be that Bidwell copied, but rather what Bidwell copied. His choices fit the tenor of the times. He selected uncompromising passages. He repeatedly chose fighting words. In addition to his first code and his second cipher, I'm maintaining that Bidwell developed yet a third code in his layered language about opposing your adversary. He employed a semantic interplay of sorts, speaking of two things at once, that Bidwell preached on the enemy in the critical pre-revolutionary year of 1774 is telling. He urged opposition, he urged resistance. Was it to the devil only? or possibly also the redcoats. I'll, I have been willing to bear my full proportion toward the extraordinary expense of the war, he wrote in a letter to the town in 1780. That included for him no salary, reluctantly, for four years. Plus, in 1781, he sold 450 uh, pounds of beef that went for the war effort for six pounds and 15 shillings. So Bidwell supported American independence, though he was impoverished by the, prof by the process. By the time of his petition to the town, age weighed heavily on him. He complained about bodily weakness and the cold of the meeting house with its broken windows that let in the weather and prevented all but 10 or 12 persons from attending. I don't wonder about that. He probably never received the back pay he sought from the town. Independence came September 3rd, 1783. Adonijah Bidwell died on June 2nd, 1784. Now, Bidwell was not the only minister in that area, area to use short writing. One of his near neighbors was the Reverend Jonathan Edwards, 1703 to 1758, a premier American philosopher and theologian, as well as a leading new light figure in the great awakening religious revival, which shook the colonies in the 1730s and 1740s, Edwards also wrote shorthand, particularly in his youth. He used another of the short writing alphabets, cataloged by Upham, a system devised in 1632 by the Reverend Thomas Arkeston in England, the, the home of all early modern shorthand systems. Not only did Edwards write in this alphabet during his youth, he also continued as an adult to identify the locations where he preached his sermons with the Archisden system. He left no sermon manuscripts in shorthand, however. One curious fact. From at least July 1751 to December 1757, Edwards and Bidwell lived just miles apart. 
In his exile from Northampton, Massachusetts, Jonathan Edwards, Yale, 1720, served the Stockbridge Church and an associated Mohican uh, Indian congregation. Adonijah Bidwell, Yale, 1740, served the Monterey Church all his life. But there is no record that they ever corresponded or ever met. Thank you. Do you want to, um, did you have the one more slide you wanted to mention or the puzzle you wanted to oh, mention as well? Uh, well let's, let's ask if there are any questions first and then we can sure. that slide maybe later. Yeah, let me stop my screen sharing. So I want to see if anyone has, um, let's see, any questions here. Um, I did have one. I just need to go back through my notes. Um, so I think you said that there were um, how many like different types of code writing? I feel like you and I talked about this when we met last week or earlier in the week, but you know, about how many different types of code writing were people using at this time? Well, there were uh, there are 48 cataloged by Upham in uh, the 1870s, but uh, 24 of those cover most of the uh, most of the time before Bidwell. A mm -hmm. uh, lot of them are very, very similar. I didn't that, uh, slide in because it 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 just a lot of little squiggles, but mm -hmm. uh, it, most of them use lambdas somewhere. Maybe it's for A, maybe it's for some other letter. Mm -hmm. Most of them use a right uh, a parenthesis or a left parenthesis. They, but they they call them different things. Mm -hmm. So you have to know the specific one. You can find that out. I, I had some to decipher once, somebody else who was a notebook. I could find where it came from because that's the only one that made words. Mm. Uh, else just gave, uh, did, did not really give words. Mm -hmm. So I could say what, but I, uh, I couldn't say what, the woman who wrote it actually meant what mm -hmm. uh, what she was trying to say because she also uh, uh, abbreviated. A lot. Uh, so um, it gets to be a, 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 a very singular thing, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and 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 nothing. It, it the system is shared. The points along the right side often are shared for the next syllable. Mm -hmm. uh, there you don't put the vowel in you just put the next syllable but it's where you put it that shows mm -hmm. that's shared pretty much uh so you could learn them if you uh mastered it enough. but uh i have to i will be glad to admit i i have not mastered it that much but once i caught on to bidwell's short um short writing and his short cuts mm -hmm. then it's to uh, to go at it with a with a will, <laughs> and then so at the time, um, you know, the various ministers who were using the short writing, where would they have been learning this from? I mean, would you know, Ad Adonijah at Yale? Would people have been talking about this? Would it have been his colleagues? Um, there were. Uh, People who did this um, in in the uh, in the world, shall we say, there were court uh, figures and uh, and the like. Um, uh, John Cotton in uh, Massachusetts was blindsided by somebody who uh, wrote his sermons in short writing. <laughs> Uh, a man named Humphrey and got him published in England. And he was not only blindsided by that, he was also angry because uh, uh, they were making money off of him. Um, uh, but, but he was fascinated uh, mm -hmm. by that problem. Um, uh, and that was many, that was much, much earlier. I think a lot of the people, you'll notice I've mentioned Reverend so-and-so and Reverend so-and-so, it, it had a special home among clergy. Mm -hmm. uh, for their notes to to go into the pulpit, what Bidwell did. I just want to 
be sure that nobody thinks he did this to keep others from reading his notes. He, he didn't have to do that. Uh, <laughs> they would have all understood the short code anyway. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. If they if they figured it out, they wouldn't figure very much out. Uh, so uh, that was a uh, that was uh, I yeah. I think that that that's pretty much how it. Yeah, that's that. That's enough on that. <laughs> that's okay. Um. So I. Oh yeah. So I think there's a hand up. Scott has a question, and David has a question. David, do you want to go since you're unmuted? Okay. Sure. So, I'll let Dr. Hall go first. Yeah, go ahead. So, uh, oh, Scott, I, I, there you are. <laughs> I was looking for you on my screen here. So, uh, the identification, the identifying of his sources, did he write those on the manuscript uh, itself? I mean, did he say this is from Burkitt or so forth and so on? He never did that. He never did that. He did not reveal any of uh, this. Uh, I got this from the internet. I found a, a set of phrases that didn't look like Mr. Bidwell. I thought, I don't know. And I put that into the, into the machine and bang, it lit up like a Christmas tree, a thousand ex references to Matthew Henry. Uh, and and that, that was how I found that. And, and, then, and, and does a will survive for him with an inventory of his library or his estate? Um, there are yeah. quite a few. Uh, yeah. yeah, I was going to say, yeah, so Adonijah did have, um, there was a, um, a death inventory that we do have a copy of. Um, you know, he did have some books, but they're not um, specified in there. So we're not sure. We have, five or six of them. Yeah, well, exactly. And we've had a few donations and things that we do have, um, but I don't know off the top of my head if he has any of the books that um, that were mentioned, but I might have to go back and look through our archive. So, so one last question uh, relating to this. Uh, so he's too far away from the Hampshire Ministers Association. It's too far to go, right? Because it, it had a uh, group library. Oh, really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It would be far to go there. and uh, But it wouldn't be far to meet uh, Jonathan Edwards uh, in the next town. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and there were ecclesiastical, ecclesiastical events that they might have been involved with uh, that, that happened. So there, but it was uh, not anywhere near like the kind of, uh, of uh, communication possible nowadays. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Where, is it, where did Scott go? <laughs> oh, there you are. Yeah, hello, David. Um, hello. Yeah, this is fascinating talk. You know, I, I'm just curious. It's not surprising that someone like Jonathan Edwards would have access to uh, a shorthand system that was put forth in a public book, or someone like Bidwell, people who are college educated. But there are also educated. right. There are also books of sermon notes from people who were not college educated in shorthand. And I, I'm just wondering how uh, people like that might have been exposed to these systems or um, are their systems so idiosyncratic or self-devised that, uh, that they simply can't be read uh, at this point? Are, are, you, are you familiar with that at all? Or? I, I don't know, except the one that I did read of, uh, of uh, John Pynchon as a youth, uh, and uh, he he did a lot himself, but he was a kid. He was 14 years old when he wrote it and uh, developed his own symbols. So I, I think uh, that you can still break it if you want to go at it and take the time. Sometimes you don't get more than one um, breakthrough uh, in the course of several days. You have to try it one way and another way and another way. Try to find the right word. There was this, something in uh, in in reading uh, John Pynchon. It was a kind of a series of circles, and I thought for a long while that it meant blah blah blah, but it turns out to mean through or thorough. It means several things beginning with th, uh, and that doesn't. That's not very usual for him. 
Um, I, I, I would encourage anybody to try anyway. Uh, it, it's a code breaking kind of, uh, of um, uh, task. And, uh, uh, but, but, uh, but nobody is, uh, is that clever. They don't want it to be a code like codes today, which are very difficult. They, they want it to be something they can read. Um, then, and so that's why they, uh, uh, that's the plan. So <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's what they, it was written to not to conceal, mm. but for personal uh, recollection. Mm. And he could take this set of sermons. I can do two or three sermons which have dates at the top and uh, they're all quotations all the way through and uh, do those at different times. And there are some times when he actually did later his later hand writing uh, in his later script uh, in the code. It, it seems clear that he reviewed what he had from a previous 20 years and made annotations on it, some improvements of other places he could go with it. So he could change it. And in fact, he has uh, three extra um, uh, scriptures on the top of one of them. He has the one that it is, but then there are three others. You could start from any one of the others. He was talking about pride. Well, he's off and running. <laughs> he's got the, got the paper, he's ready to go. <laughs> I think that's how it works. Yeah, no, this this is so, it's so it's so fascinating, and I, I feel like too, it's something. It's a topic I have not had not come across until I started working at the Bidwell House, um, realizing. And it's interesting to see how prevalent it was. Uh, does anybody else have any mm. questions um, for David? I'm just gonna scroll through and make sure nobody's waving at me. Um, I know you had one other small puzzle, David, that you wanted to share if we had time. I have a puzzle. Oh, wait, there's one I more question. I have Sorry. a puzzle. Sorry, Scott has one more question. Well, just to, just to follow up, I just want to say, uh, David, this work that you're doing is so vital and it's so important. And I hope that perhaps selfishly, in addition to whatever other historical projects you have going at the moment, you might consider writing a brief handbook on how to approach deciphering this short writing. That would be just such oh. an invaluable service along with your other works to, to the historical profession. Uh, I, I, I'd like to encourage you, go to it. Now, I don't know how to tell you, just my, my introduction to John Pynchon tells how I stumbled through that. And everyone is going to be different. Uh, with that and Nigel Bidwell, I have what I have today for you and what I had for the uh, conference. Um, it will come out, uh, I trust, in a printed uh, form, uh, a, uh, an electronic journal sometime next year. Uh, it's on, on a much longer version of it. But it, it won't say anything more than what I have said to you. Just further examples, I think. Um, that's, Scott, that's about all I'm up for. <laughs> so it, it can't be generalized. You know, as I say, we go to the meeting and I hear about Tyronean notes from the ancient world, well, yeah, right? about somebody else doing yeah. um, uh, stuff uh, at the same time as I am, I'm a, a woman writing short writing and mostly recipes. And then I, then we go to Chinese short writing and we all say, isn't that interesting? But there's no interconnections. Each one is a separate code solving uh, exercise. But there's a lot of stuff. You are right, Heather, there are uh, there are acres of this, and and I I took uh, a sermon that uh, 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 that John Demos identified at Bidwell House, uh, two or three sermons, and I I have the Pride sermon. I I I, I have it, and I can uh, make it available. Um, it it's one sermon you have in your possession, mm -hmm. able to to crack, um, uh, plus things on the uh, the. Uh, Hidden Histories Congregational Library website. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, was the congregation really that small? I 
there were 10 or 12 people who came in the cold of winter <laughs> because the windows were cracked. Right. Well, the, the meeting house never was never finished. Um, yeah. So it was it was just drafty and cold. So one of the parts of the story we tell at the Bidwell house is that the house, um, the, his, his death inventory showed that he had 48 chairs. And we assume that he would occasionally just hold his, um, you know, hold meetings and have and, and give his sermons at his yeah. house where he could actually heat it because the meeting house was terribly cold people had to walk pretty far to get to it so um so we don't really know i mean we we i think we could probably go back and figure out but i i do have a feeling that you know on the really cold days yes it probably was only 10 or 12 people and then i think isaac has a question or is that um i see that they were trying to ask earlier Laura. 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 yes i was just about to say my brother david that we have enjoyed this immensely. Okay. <laughs> I don't have a question. You don't have any question about short writing? No, no, not In yet. Life, improving your life with short writing. <laughs> <laughs> we have loved it. Thank you. Uh, the Bidwell himself um, stopped preaching as kind of a job action in Monterey uh, because they didn't pay him during the revolution. Well, he didn't mind that except he did. It uh, really hurt him and uh, he didn't get any pay for it. So he stopped and they said, why did you stop? As if anybody was going. I <laughs> very few people showed up and I don't, uh, and I have having read enough of his sermons, I find nothing uh, terribly exciting, I have to say myself. Um, I don't know how many times I'd go if uh, <laughs> if I had the opportunity. <laughs> I, I'm not sure, and I might have gotten very tired of it of him. Mm -hmm. uh, he did uh, get reinstated after his complaint in 1780, and and stayed on a couple of well, just until his death. I think he was preaching mm -hmm. until the very end. I think so. Same notes that you have <laughs> at the Bidwell House. Yes. <laughs> um, all right. Well, before we run out of time, do you want to share your puzzle that you were yes. speaking about? Can you can you put the puzzle up? Yeah. So let me share my screen again. Uh, let's see. This one. Okay. There it is. Oops. Is that are you next. seeing the are you seeing yeah I know it's not letting me go to the next one. Oh, there it is. Okay, great. Yeah, that's it. So this is at the end of uh, one page in his later writing, which is always the problem for that YT uh that ergo his Latin again to and I'm not sure what it says, uh be of highest profit while we are entrusted with our Lord's goods to use and improve them. It's, it, by the way, it's a sermon on uh, uh, the steward. So as M, 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 F of use and advantage, what we give. Why does he have three M's in a row? Do you see the last line there? Yeah. I think it's make mine maple. I don't know what it is. <laughs> so if, if that context, <laughs> uh, many more something, I, I don't know. And maybe it's the 18th century version of time, treasure, and talents. Well. The three T's. No, it's three M's. No, uh, I'm, just, I'm making a joke. I just <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, time to, yeah. He uses stock phrases very commonly. Um, so I'm looking for a stock phrase, but F of use, something of use and advantage, uh, what we give to make some further of use. No, I, it, it's a puzzle. I don't expect really to find out what it is, but I'm showing you something that I haven't the faintest idea what it means. And, uh, uh, 
you know, I, I, I look at it and I think, uh, make mine maple or three M's in a row. I, I, <laughs> uh, <laughs> David, could it be man may make? I can't figure out the F, but so as man may make. Yeah, many could be one of the things too. Many men, so as many men, something F, a well, word beginning with F of use. Find of use, find of use, I don't know. The, the well, app I, I just operative. show it to yeah. you so you see the uh, nature of this uh, <laughs> of this game. <laughs> Great, well, it's, that, it's so interesting, and I'm sure we'll all. I'm going to stop the share now, just so I can see what's going on here. But yeah. Um, yeah. I'm sure we'll all be thinking about it, and I'll tell everyone if anyone has any ideas what it might be, feel free to um, email the museum. <laughs> <laughs> and I will pass your notes <laughs> along to David. <laughs> well, great, David. Uh, I just uh, we really enjoyed your uh, enthusiasm and uh, uh, your your skills. Of course, I'm a brother here, and uh, uh, <laughs> admire your your work. Uh, you you have a persistence that even though I'm a PhD with all these postdocs, I I do not have. So uh, congrats. And, and Plus, you're older, brothers, <laughs> therefore superior. So. <laughs> I laughed quite often at your great wit, David, yeah, and your I mean, humor. It was yeah. wonderful. Yeah. Great. Thank, you. thank everyone who joined in. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, thank you everyone for attending tonight. And, you know, I'll just echo what they said. This was just, it's so fascinating. It's such an interesting little bit of history that, um, you know, so many of us don't really know anything about. So I thought this was, this was great. Um, and yeah, I just want to thank everyone it's, for attending. It's a way to know a little bit more about him. Uh, you won't find much uh, personal in the notes. You won't find anything about the times, except why does why are you telling me this now? Is always interesting. Why are in seventeen seventy four the enemy? Right. You know, especially when. We know who the enemy is. He wears coats and he walks around stalking like a lion. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 uh, I, 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 I noticed that he tended to plagiarize rather boldly. And so I mentioned it uh, uh, to John Demos and he said, for heaven's sake, we have enough time Enough, enough trouble raising money for the well house now. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't call him a plagiarist. So I, I hope I have redeemed him some from his, uh, his actual position as supporter of the American Revolution and a patriot. His son served in the uh, Revolutionary Army. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, Junior. So um, it's yeah. a small corner of the world, but it's a picture of it. Exactly. I'm going to do 10,000 cartwheels. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you again, everyone, for thank coming you. tonight. Thank, thank you, you David, so much for your presentation. Um, and yeah, great. Everybody have a wonderful night. Thank you. All right. Bye, everyone.